Hello, and welcome back to the Racing Writers Podcast. I'm your host, Kelly Crandall. Good episode for you today. The ever chatty Tommy Joe Martins is the guest, and I love talking to Tommy, and this episode's going to tell you exactly why. If you follow Tommy on social media or you've had the chance to interact with him at all, you'll know that Tommy's a very opinionated guy, but he's very passionate, very knowledgeable about the sport. So anytime I want a conversation, I can go to Tommy Joe Martin. So this is a really good episode to pick his brain on racing, the money behind racing, what it's like to be in the back half of the garage, essentially, being a team owner he was a team owner before the money ran out in the truck series he's going to explain that and some of the other things you're going to hear is how his deal with bj mcleod came about he gets to run some xfinity races this year you're going to hear him talk about why he felt like his truck team was a failure and there's also a question in here that i've always wanted to ask a driver that i knew i could get an answer from tommy joe and it took about 16 minutes for me to finally get in there and ask the question so that's really cool you're going to hear that Some other things you're going to hear are Tommy's opinion on things that should be talked about in the sport and things that are not brought up. Most of it has to do with money. You know, Tommy and I have had the conversation before that for whatever reason, money in racing is a taboo subject. So he's going to talk about that. He's going to give you the Cliff Notes version of his racing career for those who may not know who he is or where he came from. He's also going to talk again about the truck series, whether or not he'd ever run a truck again, and quite a few other things. We talked a couple weeks ago in the hauler at Watkins Glen while it was raining, and we got about, I think it was about 40, 45 minutes here with Tommy Joe. So I think you're really going to enjoy this one. Again, I love talking to him. I appreciate it. Thanks again, Tommy. As always, I hope you are rating and reviewing. Please do that. Please subscribe. It's honestly not for my own vanity. It helps keep the podcast out there. It helps bring attention to it and show everybody that this is worthy of listening to. So I appreciate everybody's already done that. And please keep doing it. Got a couple more episodes, of course, coming. We've already got some taped. So keep looking. I hope you have subscribed because you're going to get them every week. They're going to be right there in your downloads of all your podcasts. So I hope you are subscribed. Let's get to the show. Tommy Joe Martins, Xfinity Series driver, former Camping World Truck Series owner and driver. He is on the Racing Riders Podcast. Here we go. So Tommy, we're sitting here, and and what's funny, you can see my notebook here. I actually don't have much written down because I know you and I can just have a conversation. So I've got some things to kind of trigger my memory here of of what I want to chat about. But first off, just how are you doing? It's a wet day in Watkins Glen, but in general, how is Tommy Joe doing? Uh, We're good. Uh, We're waiting this out like uh, mostly everybody else is. Um, I'll put it this way. Our half of the garage is trying to avoid this at all costs uh i think the thing is on a day like this is the weirdest day because we it's raining today but everybody knows it's 90 percent chance to be dry tomorrow so this doesn't teach you literally anything about your car about the track it, it's none of this is going to translate so uh, for me i mean i've got some road racing experience but i've never been around here and it's like you can't what am I going to learn today? And so we're just going to kind of hold on and kind of do the NASCAR required couple of laps we got to do and then really kind of aim for tomorrow. And you're going to see probably a lot of people treat qualifying tomorrow like a practice. Yeah. And it was just funny. You told me that you're going to have to go out there on slicks. So this is going to be like going down I-77. Not so much in rush hour, but Yeah. yeah, trying to control going. Yeah, this is, this is going to be interesting. We were joking about it in the rookie meeting. It was like Cendric and uh, I think Justin Haley and some of those guys there that have road racing experience. And they're like, uh, well, you know, the, telling the crew chief that we're going to have to go out. None of the crew chiefs wanted to go out. That was kind of the, the agreement in the garage was we're not doing this. And then when everybody found out you had to, well, then it turned into, well, okay, but, you know, we're only going to make a few laps. And then what happens? As soon as you get race car drivers out there on a track, Everybody's going to start looking up there at the speed. Well, we're, I mean, I could probably go a little faster. And so that's, I heard the radio for Christopher Bell, uh, who's awesome. And he said, he said, oh man, you know, these rain tires actually have a lot more grip. And the first thing the crew chief said was like, do not go faster. So because everybody knows like what, you're not going to learn anything from this. And it's just going to be a bunch of guys trying to one up each other. And it's not going to lead to anything. Yeah. Yeah, then you go out there, you try and do more than you possibly can, you over push it, and then it's just going to turn into a disaster. Right. But hey, that's what makes racing fun. So speaking of racing, how has it been for you this year? You're in, you're in a little bit diff- different situation. You got hooked up with, with BJ McLeod over here. Just take me back through kind of how this deal came together. I know you've talked about it a little bit, but to go from being primarily in the truck series and making a name for yourself, really getting a lot of attention down there with what you were doing with your own team, and then hey, now you get to run some Xfinity races. Kind of how all did this come together? 
Yeah, so we had kind of gotten into a weird spot with the truck team there last year. So we ran the first few races of the year. We did a partnership with Brandon Brown, who runs out here in Xfinity some too. And we didn't have a paid driver. We didn't have a sponsor. We weren't sure what direction we were going to go with. And so with my dad and I, we had decided, okay, well, for us, maybe the next foray is Xfinity. Uh, it just honestly pays better. And we said, you know, if we can come out here and make some races, that'll balance our budget a little bit better. It's relatively the same cost, Kelly, going out and running Xfinity as it is running trucks. Regardless of what everybody would tell you, it's really, from our small team perspective, it's like one extra set of tires you got to worry about, and it's the exact same motor, and the races are generally only 50 to 100 miles longer. And so you go, well, I'm going to get paid way more. You know, the difference there is it's obviously more competitive at the back of the field even, uh, and there's guys that have been doing this a long time. Like, I say the back of the field, we're still talking about Johnny Davis and Carl Long and some guys that have been around racing for a long time, and so they got this thing covered, so it's tough. I'm not sitting here trying to diss the X Wendy series or the truck series. It's tough in all of it. A but it was kind of tough. different kind of tough. And so it was really a money decision where we said, okay, we're going to come out of here, try to run a few races. The first race we went to Richmond, we missed qualifying in on time by like a couple hundredths of a second or something. And we had another one planned. And I think BJ, at the time, they had struggled last year with that 78 and 8 car. I mean, they were 36th, 35th in the standings, I believe because we have somebody that updates on us every week <laughs> where he shows us where we were just a year ago. Uh, so they were down in the standings. So I don't think really BJ had a lot of people lined up wanting to drive for him. And I was in a weird spot where we weren't sure if we were moving forward. Are we going to shut the team down? Are we going to try to attempt to another race? What are we doing? And so I think we were both in a position where there were <laughs> – it was almost like there weren't a whole lot of options. <laughs> like BJ didn't really have anybody that wanted to drive a car 36th in points. And – I wasn't sure I was going to even have a career anymore. And so BJ called me, asked me if I wanted to do the deal at Pocono. Needed somebody to fill in. Said if it went well, we could maybe do a few more races. He said it went okay. I didn't tear anything up. We went to Michigan, same thing. It just kind of rattled off. And our third race was Iowa. And that's where we finished 11th. And so it's kind of been smooth sailing after that. I think after that, BJ said, okay, this was a really smart move. And I think BJ, and I love the guy, so I'm not talking any junk here. I think BJ likes being able to hold me over the rest of the garage as like something that he figured out first before anybody else did, right. where he said that he looked at practice times and stuff from trucks and always thought that I was a consistent driver and maybe just we just didn't have it all figured out yet, but there was some talent there. And so when he gave me that shot, everybody thought it was hilarious because they were like, man, he finishes 25th in every truck race. That guy's tearing stuff up. Yeah. You know, what are you doing? He's going to tear your, tr your car up. And he said, no, trust me, this guy's pretty good. And it's wound up, I've at least not made him look like an idiot yet. So it's, it's been a pretty good partnership. So going back to the truck stuff, was the plan for you guys to try to continue? Or was there just something that was overwhelmingly that came out of, came out and said, no, we, we can't do this anymore? Kind of go back to that decision. Because, again, I mean, you're running your own team. You kind of get to do it your own way. But it just at the end of the day like you said you got to a point where you didn't know what your career was going to take so when it comes to the truck series was there something that really kind of showed you guys hey we, we we have to do this yeah i think it was the end of the year last year so we had Austin wayne self come over he during 10 races for us Austin was in a kind of a similar position he had a little bit of sponsorship money but they didn't have a whole lot and they weren't going to be able to take that to like a premier team and run more than a few races whereas we did a deal with him where he was going to run 10 with us and we had multiple top 15 finishes. And so we knew that our equipment, we weren't like back of the field equipment in the truck series. We thought we were okay. We didn't think we were the, like the greatest team, but we thought we were a solid 15th to 20th place team. And with the addition of the spec motor, maybe we could be that fringe top 10 team, you know, leading into this year. And so we kind of geared up. Um, Austin wound up running with Nice this year. He had a deal, it was a business to business thing where that kind of worked out. Okay, cool. We had some other drivers contact us with interest. It, the, it just none of it ever developed, and so we were heading into this year again. And it's really heading into the off season, Kelly, is when the money really is dried up. You're at the end of the year. Your stuff's used up. You got motors that are sitting there that need to be refreshed. You got trucks that need to be gone through. There's probably a rules change where you got to be a, doing something to the bodies. And now you got three months where you have no income as a race team. You have no income, wow. right? So you're still paying payroll. You're still paying everybody in the shop. You're paying your shop. You're paying materials, 
new parts, all this stuff in the off season and no income unless you have a sponsor. So we were talking to drivers and it just never, we had a couple on the line that kind of they changed their mind a little bit last minute. And this is not me, again, there's no hard feelings or anything. It's just they went a different direction. We were sitting there a couple months before we got to Daytona and it was like, wow, we don't have anything lined up. And so anything we did was going to be out of our own pocket, just hoping something came together and we just didn't want to do that. And uh, you know, that's tough to do because it felt like we were right there. We'd already bought the motors. I mean, so we were geared up, and that's why it caught our guys by such a surprise, and it was such a bummer, but it was kind of that decision was made over the course of a couple of weeks where it was like, man, you know, can we really justify doing this, basically just throwing, you know, the fishing line out there going, well, I hope something comes together for Daytona a couple of weeks prior. We just didn't want to, we didn't want to take a risk. As a driver, you, you mentioned how, you know, when BJ got you, it was kind of like, you know he's dangling you over, over the series, and 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 I and I find that, but I find that cool because it has to be hard to explain to people that. So in that moment where you guys lose the truck series, and now your career, like you said, you didn't know if you were going to have anything left, and you know that whether it's right or wrong, people look at you. Okay, you were a guy in trucks who ran, you know, didn't do anything spectacular, and 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 all this other stuff. So explain how. Is there a way to explain what it feels like when you're in that situation, knowing that you you want to still race, like you don't want your career to be over, but you don't have really anything to to pitch to people, if that makes sense. Like, no disrespect to you, but you know what your position is. I mean, can you just explain what it's like going through that, trying to find something else? Yeah, I mean, I think we were a failure, and that's not – Again, nothing against my guys, nothing like that. We just went into it with some expectations, and we got some better motors over the course of the year. We were spending money, and you know, had a good pit crew. We had a Hendrick development pit crew, and we like we were trying to really up our game competition-wise, and we just never had that one run where it was like, man, what a great job! Tommy Joe finished top ten today. They really overachieved. We just never had that moment, and it, we were close, but we never broke through. And so then you're sitting there at the end of a year and a half when really we didn't have anything going on. And you're going, wow, did, you know, was that, was any of this worth it? Like we never really got the payoff to this. And for BJ, I think he did this deal with me to start off. He thought there was something there and he'll tell you that, you know, but you don't really know until you see it play out. And so he was skeptical. And he kept me on a pretty short leash there for a little while, um, where it was, you know, drop to the back. We don't want to mess anything up. Just take care of it and all this. And then he, as time has gone on now, he's learned, okay, this is a guy I can trust in my equipment. We're really lucky. I, don't, I need some wood to knock on. We haven't had a DNF all year. Um, so that's been great. And it's really helpful for them because for the guys, it's like the same car every week. And so the, the place that I was in was I have a reputation of being a really loud mouth 25th place guy and it's like why would you want a guy that had never really run great and then could potentially get you in trouble from a PR standpoint that's like the last guy you would want that's way more trouble than it's worth and for BJ I think it was just he was in a situation where there wasn't anybody coming calling he maybe saw a little bit of potential with me and said you know we can maybe work with this and it's turned out to be a pretty good deal I think we've we've gotten better as a program and also, I think probably my personality has helped just draw a little attention to me, but also the team. When, like, we've kind of overachieved at times, people are like, wow. People maybe notice it a little bit more than maybe they would have last year without before I joined up with the team. Here at the 878 team, when you guys sit down and kind of look at what you're capable of doing, what's a good weekend for you guys? When you walk away Friday night, Saturday night, what's a good weekend for, for this, this company? So our cars, I mean, so two types of speed, right? All right. What, what can you do from a driver standpoint and what can you do from a car standpoint? So like most of the time when we show up with BJ stuff, we're running the same car we ran the week before, generally. Like right here at the road course, I'm in a speedway car. So you just know, like we're not maxed out car wise. Like BJ has improved dramatically. We have built more flange fit cars, sorry, the excuse me, the composite body cars. I call them flange pit cars. You might hear that too. But yeah. composite body cars, the lighter cars, 
done some stuff to the chassis. BJ's upgrading his program, but it's just taking a lot of time because he doesn't have as many people. So right now it's like we have one composite car per team. Well, you're going to want to run that everywhere. You're not going to just like run the composite car at the mile and a half and we'll run a steel car at the short tracks. Like, no, you're going to want to run your good car, but now you're running it every week. And so it's getting worn out. And so I think realistically, speed-wise, car-wise, we're probably like a top 30 team. That's where we're at. Now, I think BJ and I are decent drivers, and we might hustle it in there to the top 25. And I think when we come away from the track with a couple clean cars and a couple top 25 finishes, that's a okay day. Like, we don't feel bad about that day. When you start finishing in the 30s or something happens, yeah, that's a bad day. Really, when something gets torn up, that's a bad day, we're, no matter where we finish. But we've been happy about top 20s. Like, for us, that is winning our race. And so, like... In New Hampshire, we looked back at the standings, and I finished 20th on the dot. And there was really nobody in front of us that we go, man, we're racing with them every week. Like, it was all teams that are better than us. And we can we can say that. They go, they are spending more money than us, and they're, they're in another league. But everybody behind us, like, we beat, you know, the 35, the 36, the 52. We, I mean, we beat everybody in our bracket, you know, the 51 had an issue whatever and so we said wow we won our race that day and finished 20th and which is like kind of weird that you would go oh you finished 20th and everybody's like happy but we did we walked away from that and we said now that's that was a really good finish that's probably as good as we could hope for so that leads into a question that i want to ask and i'm going to ask you tom i've never asked any driver this but i'm going to ask you tommy because i know because i know or i hope you know it won't come from a place of disrespect and i know you're going to give me a straight answer so you just said there you guys won your race. Yeah. I've always been curious, drivers in your position, drivers on this back end of the garage, everybody knows unless something absolutely crazy happens, you are not going to go out and win at Watkins Glen. You're not going to go out and win at Iowa. So for my, my, my question has always been knowing that, but, no, but you guys still show up every week you or a car along whoever it is you guys show up you want to race what makes you show up though every week knowing that i'm not going to win a nascar race and, and like i said i don't want that to be disrespectful but it ta- it has to take a certain group of athletes because you look at you look at football everybody wants to go win the super bowl everybody makes their team capable of winning the super bowl in tennis or golf you want to go out and be the best golfer in the world in nascar not everybody can be a top five, top ten team, and know they have a legitimate shot at winning a race. So for somebody like you personally, I know you can't speak for everybody in the garage, but what makes you want to be a race car driver knowing that right now in your life you're not in that position to go out and, and, and win a race? Right. Yeah, and, and that's a good question. You know, and that's something that I'm sure when you ask the you know guys from the bigger teams over there, and I'm not talking about drivers, I'm talking about just the managers and stuff, they would say, I don't know why they do it. And I've heard that. Like, I don't know, what, you know, why is BJ McLeod Motorsports even out here? They can't afford to buy new tires every week. And they can, you know, what are they doing? And it's like, well, the problem you got is as an owner, first, once you've bought all this stuff, you're kind of invested. And like, who are you selling it to? You can't really sell it to anybody. So really, the only way you make money is by staying out here. You're kind of committed at that point. So I get why BJ does it. He's in now and there's no going back and so it's just we got to find out a way to make it work and from a driver standpoint i mean I, I look at f1 like you don't look at the guy that's driving for you know renault and go man why is he even out there he's driving for renault they can't win a race like we all know renault cannot win a race they're not good enough you know like daniel ricardo signed with him today maybe they're improving the program whatever but like you look at i don't know like a sauber they're not winning a race they're just not like a great finish for them would be like a seventh place. That would be like, oh my gosh, that's amazing, right? So why is any why is anybody there? Well, because it's Formula One. It's the highest form of racing in the world. Like we're in NASCAR. This is it in America. It's us in IndyCar. That is the top. And I'm at the second highest level of motorsports in America, as far as I'm concerned. This is it. I'm basically one step below the cup ring, however you want to say it. And I feel like I'm, I deserve to be here. From a talent standpoint, an experience standpoint, like I belong in this garage. And so for me, that's what it is. It's like, okay, maybe that finish isn't going to be a win, 
but my currency is kind of the respect level in the garage, which is when I take a BJ McLeod Motorsports car that everybody says that's a 30th place car, and I finish 18th with it, and they go, man, Tommy Joe is driving the crap out of that thing. And I think that goes a long way towards the opportunities that I've been able to get and, and been approached about. This now it's it turned in from you know Tommy Joe's running his mouth as a 25th place driver in the truck series to man Tommy Joe is really overachieving for for BJ and so that's that's what keeps you around. It might not be a win, but it's a a goal where you go okay you know what it'd be awesome we're at a road course if we could run in the top 20 all day and maybe have a chance you know for a top 15 top 10 at the end of it that would be a, just a huge day for our team and so it, there's always a, you know a hot dog at the end of the string here that we're chasing it just might not be that podium finish you know like some of those other guys get to chase week in week out yeah well I appreciate you answering that question because again I, I knew I saved it for somebody that I figured would would, would answer it and, and, and give me a straightforward answer well, so you over, overachieving and then, so overachieving here is what leads to opportunities in motorsports that's what it is well, two things. There's financing and then overachieving. So for a guy like me, like maybe I don't have the financing. It's not like I'm not trying. But probably my opportunities are going to come from a team manager, a team owner, seeing me in a lesser situation and going, you know what, Tommy Joe doesn't tear up a lot of stuff and he's fast and he's got a lot of respect in the garage area. Or maybe another driver that's in a fortunate position being like, I'll tell you, if you can get somebody, you need to get him because he's doing more with less. And so look at what Matt Benedetto has been able to do now. I mean, he was literally driving for Curtis Key as a starting park guy in the Xfinity Series three years ago or four years ago. And now look at what he's where we're at. And was anybody say that Matt Benedetto was wasting time? Like, definitely not. Like, Blake Cook was kicking around in the back. Same thing, starting park guy. Was he wasting time? Like, no. It's like you just get your opportunities at a different time here. And as soon as you walk away... You got zero chance. You got zero chance in your couch. So that's why we're out here every week. Well, like I said, I appreciate you answering that question. So you've now touched on something that I wanted to really sit down and talk to you about. You've said that you could be viewed as, you know, a loudmouth kid and, and, you know, a PR problem and whatnot. What do you, like, honestly, though, what do you think your reputation is? Because uh, certainly with social media, you are not afraid to be that person who is going to offer their opinion, whether it's about you, your team, or the sport overall. What do you think your opinion, your reputation is? I think my social media presence is very different than my real life presence. It's just so different. It's like I am a really laid back person. You know, what I cannot stand and what I just cannot you know, just have sitting out there is something that I think is just a lie or a cover up or a PR BS answer type of thing that has come from a side of this sport for a really long time and I just would not stand it for it at all and so I think with my blog that I did in 2016 I really opened people's eyes to a lot of really the realities of what's going on in the back of this garage which is people are not making a lot of money teams cannot afford the tire bill every week and the teams are really struggling and we're not talking about a small percentage of the garage here like it's not like well there's a few teams in the back and they're always going to struggle well yeah I mean, I get it. Like, if you're losing in a car race all the time, of course you're struggling. Like, I mean, I, you know, I understand it. But when Brian France, and I'm calling him by name here, when Brian France has stood up and said, well, the teams in the back always are going to struggle, well, there's a reason for that. And he gave that in a press conference at Homestead a few years ago where he just said, well, you know, the teams in the back are always going to – there's always going to be teams that struggle and there's always going to be teams that run good. And, you know, to run good, you always got to find sponsorship, and that's just part of it. It's like there are so many more things to talk about than just a blanket answer. And to me, it's like we're not – NASCAR doesn't seem like they're talking about it. And I think that's what's really bothered me. So, you know, we talk about my social media presence and the stuff that I talk about all the time. I just want some of this stuff to be brought up. It's like it, it's not getting covered up. As I talked to Jeff Gluck about that, you know, because he goes, well, you know, you, is it like they're avoiding it? I don't think they're avoiding it. I just, they just don't talk about it. It's just not brought up. I think they really concern themselves more with the issues that are facing competition from the high end, which is like Gibbs is trying to get away with a sway bar infraction, you know, that kind of stuff, which is like, I get it. That's going on too. But you can't have teams that can't afford to buy the tires like that seems like it's a big deal and when I say win our race finishing 20th 
That's 20 teams out of 40. That's half the field. I mean, we're not talking about a small percentage of people here. So the fact that that's not a bigger issue to me is wild because it's like you're saying we're totally okay if this was a 20 car race. Like, do you think the fans would be okay? I think it would be an uproar. And so the fact that there isn't more movement or the fact that there's pushback, which there has been lately, it seems like there's been a line divided, Kelly, which is so weird to me. It's like uh, there's the it's turned into, well, NASCAR, you know, Steve Phelps came out and said, well, you know, we always look at the negative in this. It's like, okay, man, you can't frame it like that. (laughs) You can't frame it like, well, we're just trying to be positive and there's all these people here trying to be negative. It's like, you know what, man, if you had your house up to help finance your payroll for a third of the year because you can't get a sponsor because in their own words, teams or sponsors aren't even really caring about the lettering on the side of the car anymore. They care more about digital and B2B. And what can you do for me outside? I don't really care about that car. What can you do for me outside of that? And it's become really tough because what is a small team doing with business connections? It's just not the same thing. And I've had people chirp at me and go, well, You know, the team owners are just lazy now because look at all the sponsorships that happened in the 2000s. It's like, dude, in 1999, we didn't have the internet. Like, how are you comparing eras? Like, nobody even had a computer in 1995. You know, and now you're talking about targeted ads online. And it's so much has changed. And I think it's just a cop-out to go, well, yeah, small teams struggle. Well, there's reasons. And I think the way this thing is structured could change so much. And what it's turned into unfortunately, is a competition and balance for the front of the field to the back, equipment-wise, and development and engineering and all that has turned into a competitive imbalance. And then it's all, which has also led to the financial struggles of the teams has led to just an overabundance of paid rides, which that it was never associated with NASCAR during the great times of NASCAR. It was like, these guys are all short track heroes, local heroes, they make their way up, they get a chance with the NASCAR team. I mean, I've heard from crew chiefs that dodged during the Everham days, literally would go get a pile of guys and girls, 10, 15 at a time, to just to go test. Go test them for a few days, we'll find out who's good, and then we'll put them in a truck. When is that happening? Ever now? It's if you don't already have the money, then you're not getting in the door. And that cripples a sport, both from a competition side in the garage, a morale side in the garage. It's very disheartening to anybody that's actually in part of it. Like you think the guy that's on the crew really wants to when he knows the person that's driving isn't any good? Is he really putting his best effort forward? So that's tough. And also there's a threat of it's probably gonna get torn up all the time. So now I gotta work twice as hard to do the same job because the guy's not as good of a driver. And then from an appearance on the outside standpoint, it's the, well, where did that guy come from? And that's not to say that a person can't drive, right? I mean, just because you buy a ride doesn't mean you're a bad driver. That's where some of that bothers me. It doesn't mean you're bad, right? But it does hurt the appearance of the sport overall when a 17-year-old can just hop in a truck with no late model wins, no success, no like even they ran in a big series for a long time. And we, well, maybe he didn't win a bunch of races, but yeah, he was out there in the Southern Super Series racing for a little while. Or There's no like track record before they even get here. It's because we're rushing this so much and, and it's hurt the whole thing. It's not one thing. And so that's why I get bothered by so much of it. And why I think I comment on so much of it is maybe I just spend too much time looking at the big picture of the thing. Like, yeah, I'm a driver. I want to have success. I want to go drive the car. But what good is that if the whole thing is sinking? (laughs) Like, what good does it help me if I'm like, man, I'm standing on the, you know, the second highest step of the sport if, like, the whole ship is going down? Like, that's not helping any of us. So I'm just trying to think of the big picture more than anything else. Is that kind of why you look at the big picture is because, okay, yeah, you're here doing your thing, but at the same time, I mean, we all need to survive because there may not be nothing, there may not be something here for you to do. So, so is that kind of what goes into your, your thinking there? It's a lot of, it's a lot of self-preservation. I mean, you, you know, from running the team in the truck series and understanding the finances of it, you're like, okay, this is the bottom rung. So if we can't make it work here on the bottom rung, how is it working anywhere else, right? And so we've gone to races and like 
bought the minimum required set of tires and not had a pit crew and had my crew chief hopping over the wall that changed tires and running around in a dually and you know not flying anywhere and just we've done it as literally as cheap as you can possibly go do this and we still had to shut our race team down so if we're not making it work and it's not working for me well then there's probably a lot of other people struggling through the same thing and so then you look around and you go wow there's actually a whole lot and how many teams go into the next season in this thing with no idea if they're even going to be still be in business I guarantee if you walked around this garage right now, Kelly, and this is a crazy thing to say, if you walked to every one of the team, big ones and small ones, and said, "What's the what? who's your driver next year? And do you have a deal lined up for next year? Like, what are you going to run next year with this number? Almost every one of them would say no. They're not sure, or they weren't sure. Like, like Johnny Davis, he'd probably say, yeah, I mean, I'm going to be here, but I don't know if we're going to run yeah. a couple of these cars. Yeah. I don't know how I'm going to be here. Right, and... That's crazy. Like, could you imagine the Minnesota Vikings being like, well, it's been a good year this year, but we don't know if we're going to have a team next year. Like, how is that stable for a sport? You can't grow when there's that much instability. So final practice, I think, starts soon, but let's try and get through a few more things here. I, I mean, I mean, I could talk to you forever. Um, so aside from your blog, which I know I've talked to you about in the past, and, and blog, social media, have you ever, though, had – any kind of discussion or offered your thoughts to anybody in management at NASCAR or has that not been an option? Yeah, we've sat down a couple of times and talked and, you know, they've, you know, they've got responded to a couple of things that I've said. Um, it seemed like every discussion we had with this, and this is again, not picking on NASCAR. It seems like they have so many irons in the fire here that it's hard for them to just draw one out and say, this is a decision we're going to make. So let's say I come up there and I go, you know what, guys, we're, you're killing us with the tire bill. The tire, you know, the tires cost too much. We got to either cut the cost of the tires or run shorter races where we just have to buy fewer sets. Okay, that seemed, both of those seem like logical reasons, right? But now you go over to the other side of the garage and what are they going to say? Well, I mean, uh, tires aren't a big deal. Why would you want to cut tires? I mean, make the race longer because that's better for us. I mean, then if we have some bad luck, we have more time to, you know, kind of get back. And then what's good you're going to say? Official sponsor NASCAR. They're going to, well, we, we certainly don't want you selling fewer tires. So there's so, like, one idea, and you got three completely different perspectives from inside the same garage. And NASCAR has got to be the one to make the decision. So it's not, I don't just bash them to bash them. I understand where it's coming from. Um, and I think that's the, the issue that I ran into with some of the stuff that I wrote is it came from a place that was a frustration for me and it came across like I was angry, which maybe I was, but it's because I care about the thing so much. I want it to do well. It's not because I'm just ripping it to rip it. And that's why I think they get so defensive, which isn't helping anything. Like when it's a discussion, it should be like, Friend, like, okay, this is where I'm coming from. This is where you're coming from. Where do we meet in the middle? And instead, it turns into kind of like, oh, well, all they are is just negative all the time. And then they stop listening. And so I just want it to be an open ended discussion. So my talks with NASCAR have been, yeah, closed doors and out in the public, up, or out in the public in the open. I just hope that I've gotten some discussions moving there, which I think I have a couple of times, either by on purpose or on accident, where they, they had to discuss a few things that were going on. So for people who don't know much about Tommy Joe in general, kind of just explain, maybe give the Cliff Notes version of like where your knowledge and passion for the sport came from, kind of what your background is, because, you know, not to blow smoke, but you are one of the guys, again, if, if you read your stuff, if you follow you on social media, you, ha you, you are very knowledgeable, you're very passionate about this sport overall. Kind of just give you know where you came from how long you've been racing and, and things like that for people who don't know tommy joe but once again maybe they may stumble across something that that you've said right so i mean i started racing when i was young uh, i was about 16 but i had been a race fan my whole life i mean never it was never really in my family uh, my dad didn't race my granddad didn't race none of my friends raced it was just me having an obsession with it and i got to go karts there in mississippi where i grew up uh, ran locally, ran nationally in go-karts, and then went into sports cars when I was a little bit older. I was about 21. Um, 
and ran SCCA there, turned into late models, ran around the National Fairgrounds area, ran ASA uh, in a national touring series there, and then basically have been hopping in and out of NASCAR ever since with that, where we did it with our family team for the most part. And that's where most of my experiences come from. And that's where my eyes and really kind of my knowledge of the sport has developed is I've seen it on the bottom end every time we've ever done it it's been with a small team like bj is a better team than we were when we tried to run xfinity in 2014 and failed at it he's a little more developed along than we were uh, but it's still a small team and it comes with challenges and so i look at it from that and that's why you know just to throw an example out there like rob kaufman um he and i got into like a little twitter thing whatever which we went and talked and we're everything's fine it's not like this is any held grudges or anything but he's looking at the sport from like if there were a, a day and night comparison, I mean, there, you could not pick two things that are further apart. He's only looking at it from the Race Team Alliance, Hendrick, Ganassi, Gibbs, Penske, top level. And in fairness, I'm probably only looking at it from the small team, Martins Motorsports, BJ McLeod, Carl Long level. And so it's not that we don't both want the same thing we want the sport to be healthy we just have two very different visions of what that is and so i guess my knowledge of the sport overall i was a fan first and when i got here you have it in your mind what it is and it wasn't that it just wasn't you have it in your mind that it's oh this is the 40 best in the world out here and you go I don't know about that and how did that guy get here and man why is this team we can't afford the tires and it's it was like the reality of it dragged me down to the point that you're like man we gotta help fix this to where it's back to where I guess in your mind that picture you have coming in and it's like kind of the reality bubble burst and and so I, I got maybe in that in a weird way I'm like chasing that like can we get back to what you pictured it to be you know when you pictured it, what what were you like? What were you picturing? Like, what what era were you watching that you're like, I want to be a part of that? Yeah, 90s and 2000s. So like the golden age of this, where it's 40 cars out there and 43 cars, and you got 60 something cars showing up for the Daytona 500, and everybody's got a full season sponsor, and there's no you know the paint scheme never changes every week. It's the same thing every week, and uh, you know Jack Roush running six cars, and it's like just this really boon of prosperity in NASCAR where like I said drivers were getting opportunities where it was if you were a standout at the lower level you got an opportunity at what was considered the top level which is what we do right here this is the top level of motorsports in America so everybody that says well you know why don't you just go win a bunch of late model races you'll get your shot that's not happening anymore look at Bubba Pollard right now can everybody just agree that that's probably the best guy in late models right now? So why isn't he getting a shot in NASCAR? Because that doesn't happen unless you have financing before you even get here. The team wants you to bring that along. So, that so it's just, that's not what a fan wants. That's not what these owners in the garage want. It's not what the drivers want. It's not what the crew wants. I'm sure NASCAR would tell you it's not what they want. Okay, well then, so we all want the same thing. (laughs) So why aren't we more active in trying to make it better? Well, like I said, we could sit here and talk forever, but two more things for you. Let you go get in the car. Is the door officially shut and locked on ever having a Martins Motorsports again? Or if if the right opportunity came, if the money came, all that, would, would you be open to trying to do that again? I, you know, I said vocally in, in 2016 and 17, and, and I'll say it again now, I, w- I would love to be a team owner in NASCAR. That's what I would really enjoy. I would love to drive for, you know, five, ten years. I don't want to do it forever, but I would like to drive, even if I never really got that big opportunity. But for me, it would be like that idea of developing a team and starting from the bottom, and it gets a little better, and, you know, you turn it into something. Just a stable truck team, a stable Xfinity team, where you knew you were going to have the doors open every year. You could bring in people and develop them, and they're young, and they get older, and they're better, and maybe they go work for a bigger team. I didn't have any anything in my mind like, I'm going to go be Joe Gibbs. No, I'm not expecting that. But just have a business that's there every year. 
and I just think until the financial model of this changes somehow, no, I don't see how. It's to buy all the stuff is one thing, Kelly. So, I mean, that's, let's just say you drop a couple hundred grand and you buy some trucks and you buy some motors and we have a hauler, we have the space. Okay, that's fine. You're still losing money every weekend you go. You're not making any money from going to the racetrack unless it's from outside funding whether it be a paid driver or a sponsor. So then why are you even doing it, right? At least in the truck series, that is. Maybe you can scrape it around a little better here in the Xfinity series, but it's still not great. I mean, BJ still has to rely on outside funding. So, and he's doing it pretty cheap. You're sitting in the hauler right now. It's not like we're in the Ritz-Carlton. And I love him. I love him. <laughs> but we're not, sit- we're not sitting in a, you know, a 2015 feather light. We're not. <laughs> Uh, you know, so it's just they're doing the best they can. It's just everybody's – it's just a, a, a downhill slope. It's just depending on the grade, right? So the problem with a big team, they're going to spend all the money they got, right? Big sponsor, you know, paid driver, whatever it is. We're going to gear up. We're going to go for it all the way. Well, as soon as – they're so geared up. they got so many people, so much equipment, so much overhead that as soon as the plug gets pulled – it's like no doubt they're losing an insane amount of money. So that's why it closes down instantly, right? Because it's built to fail. It's built up to a point that as soon as you pull, it's like Jenga. You build it so high that you pull one block and it's the whole thing's falling down. BJ is never going to build the company up to that level where one decision from a paid driver could pull the whole thing out from under him. So that's why we've run cars with no sponsorship. It's like, well, yeah, but the point is, we do have some sponsored races coming up. We just got to get there and we got to stay in the points. So it's all with the big picture in mind, but it's like, yeah, each small decision leads up to the whole thing. And so that's it. It's just that the dynamic there is just so different. So we'll end with this. You just mentioned you don't want to do it forever, but as far as you know, I, I think BJ's going to keep you around for a little bit. What's, uh, what is your outlook for the rest of the year? So BJ's always kind of had me as the fill-in guy, right? So if it's a, a sponsor driver, uh, they've got a race sponsor coming up in an area wherever they have something lined up, they do it. And I kind of get what's left. And that's fine. Like this is, again, I love it. I get to race as much as when I'm going to probably wind up running 20-ish races this year. And that's great. And I'm assuming it'll probably be sort of the same program next year, maybe a little more scaled back. I've been on the road a lot. And unfortunately, I'm not making any money off this deal. Like I'm not really getting paid a lot of money to drive for BJ McLeod. I'm getting my expenses covered, but it's really taken away from my ability to have a normal life or a job where I have some security <laughs> at all. And so I, that's, to me, maybe a compromise there, a, a 10 to 15-ish race schedule would probably be about as much as I could hope for. And I, and I think BJ's left the door open to that. We haven't really talked a whole lot about it. I think it's just the assumption that I'm going to be here, <laughs> you know. So that's good. It's good that the, the owner just assumes you're going to be back with him. Uh, but we'll sit down and talk about it, kind of hammer it out, what what to look forward to. There's some tracks that I just really enjoy driving on, but I got to fight them probably to to get there. Uh, so we'll we'll work the whole thing out. But uh, I would expect to see me back in a car again at some amount, you know, probably the 10 plus race thing again next year. Well, Tommy Joe, I appreciate you being on the podcast. I know I can come to you for a real and honest conversation. So I hope you enjoyed it and uh, go have fun playing in the rain. Yeah, appreciate it, Kelly. Good talking to you.